I think what I what I learned from all that is that you have to flex your sound for the gig, basically, you know, and and move your sound in whatever direction the music needs. I love today's guest. He's been on a few times in the past. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are talking today with Kieran Hanlon from the University of Fredonia, runs the Fredonia Bass Fest, does a ton of other things. He's arranging a ton of music, as you'll hear in this conversation, which occurred on February 20th, so kind of a different time for the world, even though I am recording this intro on March 26th, 2020, which is not really that much uh, distance between the two. But anyway, uh, we talk about Kieran's editions. We talk about the Fredonia Bass Fest, which had both Lauren Pierce and Danny Zeman, two past podcast guests on, and just about the topic of self-care, which is something we could all use a bit of these days. And I think that you'll enjoy that. It's certainly check out Kieran's arrangements that he's been doing. He's got this super cool trio edition of Eccles on his site. And yeah, go Kieran. And keep up the good work. I just find people like Kieran so inspiring. And so it's really fun to connect with them and learn what's going on in their life. And I just want to thank so much the companies that have supported this podcast over the years. Times are tough. And if you need anything bass related, music related, I know that they would appreciate it. I've got links in the show notes to all of them, but just thank you so much to D'Addario Strings, Upton Bass, The Bass Violin Shop, Steve Swan String Bass, Colstein Music, A440 Violin Shop, and Modacity. They've been so supportive of the podcast over the years, and let's do what we can to help all of these small businesses and get them back on their feet as quickly as possible. Okay, here we go with with my conversation with Kieran Hanlon. I, I, I'm so sad that I didn't get a chance to chat with you before the bass fast. It looked like a blast. Um, oh, yeah. Lauren and Danny. And uh, when, was that just this past weekend? Or when was that? Yeah, it was just this past weekend. Um, wow. And I'm um, spending the week digging out, of course. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, this is the fifth one we've done, and uh, really, yeah, you know when because Brett Shirtliff and I taught here together for a while, um, and I have to give him the uh, original credit for doing something like that. Um, when we did our first couple of years, we were both part time. It's kind of a long story. I won't bore you with it, but uh, but after you know everything kind of worked out and the job did go full time, and I was fortunate enough to to win the job. Um, I said, I got to keep doing this because the first one we did was, was so great. Uh, we had JB here from Eastman. We had mm -hmm. uh, Dan Penley was here uh, from Buffalo Philharmonic. And, uh, and then, of course, the two of us. Uh, and so in the, in the following years, uh, I actually had Brett come back the next year. And Marco Panacea, you probably know Marco. Oh, yeah. from yep. And then next year, I've uh, found uh, just been able to really get some amazing people in since then. We had... Uh, Blake Hinson and uh, Rufus Reed the year after that. And then last year we had Joel Corrington and Ralph Armstrong. Um, and this year was Lauren and Danny. So it's, it's just been, uh, it's been a treat, you know, to be able to do that every year. And we're you know just glad it's been working out. So. Wow. That's cool. Well, it's fun to, fun to follow along virtually, uh, you know, uh, and, and did you do some sort of panel discussion? I saw a very panel discussion looking th thing happening in photos. We did. And, you know, so far, at least for, for my students, um, I think that was maybe the most striking thing that, that we did. You know, you have great players come in and give a class. We all expect to have a great experience, you know, but yeah. people think panel discussion, like, well, what does that really mean? You know, and I, the first time I did that was with Rufus and Blake, because in the previous couple of years, I had felt like the, in my studio, the participants uh, that were coming from off campus, et cetera, really wanted to talk to the they had all these questions you know and like the days you know it's a one day thing it's really all we can pull off so it's it's always pretty tight the schedule yeah um and there's like no real moment for that you know or there wasn't and so i said oh well we gotta at least work that in and give everyone a chance to hear the answers too you know because i think you know it's just one of those things where you might be sitting there wondering the same thing mm -hmm. and then you hear it uh from uh you hear it from someone else and you get to so anyway we schedule that in at the end of the day, and um, and every year it's it's really interesting. It's always unique and it's always striking, and I think that's what this year was um, 
maybe the deepest topics that we've yeah. had. Um, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, how'd you get your start in music? And there's, it's always great to hear those things. But I elected to actually start off with my own questions this time, um, quasi moderated, because both, as you know, Lauren and Danny, first of all, we're all the same age within about a year of each other. Right. And, you know, my path, I, I wouldn't call it traditional, but it's definitely more traditional than than what, what those two folks are, are doing in a way, you know, um, and, and, and they have this incredible creativity and, and sort of uh, make it work and build your own gig yeah. thing going. And um, and so I because I kept trying to like when I'd introduce them, I'm like, how do I say what they do? <laughs> yeah. You know, like, I, yeah, I, I could. Well, did you, did you come up with a way to say what they do, by the way? Because I'm curious, because I struggle with that personally. Like, what the heck? And I, I usually just say musician these days or try to like, because, because you know, but what did you, did you come up with something? I think I, the closest I got to describe both of them, which was performer, teacher, innovator. Ah, that's good. I like that. I like that. Yeah. But I wanted to give them a chance to give a little bit more detail and context to how mm -hmm. they got to that point, you know? And so, <clears throat> but the, the panel discussion became a big conversation about self care actually, mm. um, which was sort of all sparked by one of my grad students, um, uh, Jake, who's, uh, he's got an incredible work ethic and that's the case on the base. And he works you know, like 29 hours a week running the grill at red Lo red lobster. Um, and, and he's just, he still gets his practice time in. And, and I think because of this conversation, he's starting to actually maybe reimagine that a little bit, but the question was something like, how do you, uh, as you finish school, which he's about to do in May, you know, keep the money flowing and, uh, you know, develop yourself so that you can actually get a gig, you know, in, in the business, you know. And it became this bigger conversation, and it was really, really exciting to talk about it. Um, and, and we had – we got into all kinds of stuff, man, including, you know, like, uh, you know, exercise and mm -hmm. uh, therapy and, mm -hmm. I mean, just like all kinds of important topics that probably even two years ago would be more taboo than they were now, you know. Um, and so that was, that was really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that, that's like one of my favorite topics, <laughs> you know, and I think it's so important. I think it's something that so many, uh, at least I know I, when I go back to my years in school, uh, I think that self-care was definitely, it wasn't the last thing on the list. I did try to work out a little bit, but I mean, I think I would sacrifice anything for the opportunity to, to move ahead career wise. You know, I used to do this crazy all night drive. I got, I got these two gigs. I will make this story brief, but I got, I, I got a gig in Milwaukee and I got a gig in Memphis and I, and I had a, I would have a concert Saturday night in Memphis and a double Sunday morning, in Milwaukee. And I had just enough time to drive and make it and brush my teeth in the street before the double, uh, in Milwaukee. So it'd be like January. I'm driving. The temperature is like 33 degrees and it's raining, you know, drive oh, all perfect. night in my suit, you know, on shave and go and play a double and then drive home an hour and a half. And like, man, I think that probably took a couple months off of my life every time I did that. And I did that for years. And, and yeah. I, that is one of many, many examples of what people do um, or, versus, or auditioning or depriving themselves. And that's it's a huge topic. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think all three of us have been sort of doing what we're doing mm -hmm. just long enough to be figuring that out finally, you know. And so it was a really cool synergy to hear it from three perspectives, three people doing really different things, you know, um, uh, but also just dealing with that, that is, it doesn't matter, you know, how famous you are. It doesn't matter uh, how much money you have or, or are making. If you're not taking care of yourself, it, it just doesn't matter. So that, so I think that's what my students are reacting to most is, is that they were just, um, and I, I have to imagine the, the off-campus registrants too, that just to actually just get that all out there and just have a conversation about it was was really cool, especially at the end of the day after they've heard everyone play a little bit and teach and then to follow it up and just celebrate with the concert at night um, was, was great. So. You know, just thinking about that, your student, Jake, or anybody in that position, I, you know, I've sort of just in my own journey really come. I, I think if you talk to me 20 years ago, 
I would have given incredibly pessimistic perspective. I'm like, what it's going to be like? Oh man, good luck. It's dog eat dog out there. And, and I, you know, that may be true in some ways, but I also over the years, if I look and I see people who really, um, who really show up every day and try to, try to, try to, uh, you know, further their craft and work hard and try to balance things out. Uh, most, most everybody who really had this sincere commitment to like do something in the arts, they might not have won a job in the Boston Symphony, certainly, or gotten an academic position. But just about everybody that I have followed long term has ended up doing something really interesting that they're getting some fulfillment out of. I don't know. And if they haven't, they just decided to do something else. But I think that tenacity, it's such a hard thing to tell a student and a student who, uh, 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 maybe this isn't the case with Fredonia because I know you've got a pretty attractive financial situation there, but a lot of, you know, like, like walking out of Northwestern, for example, with your 40, 50, a hundred thousand dollars in debt and you have no prospects. It's a, it's a tough thing. Well, and you know, we, that's something we talk about. I mean, it's true. We do have a, we have a great situation here financially. What, yeah. Tell, just tell people what that situation is. Cause it's uh what, what is the, what is the setup for Fredonia students? Well, uh-huh. <laughs> I always, I, I always get nervous to say any, to, to be quoted on any numbers, sure, but sure. the bottom line is that we're a state school. Um, so in-state tuition in, in New York is, is really, really low. Mm-hmm. You know, it might be, if you thought of any private school, average we might be at a third of that yeah. a quarter to a third of that with no help at all that's in in state and then out of state is is more but but then maybe it's half right um and in the state of new york we have something this is suny wide not just for Dunya. So we're one of i don't know i don't know how many campuses there are there's a bunch but the you know big music campuses would be us uh, potsdam stony brook buffalo mm-hmm. uh, uh purchase you know um but any any of the any of the SUNY schools have available to to the students that are New York State residents what's called the Excelsior Scholarship, um, and that is based on family income threshold. Uh, if that, I believe, right now it's one twenty five. So if your family income is less than one twenty five, um, again, this is all available online. It's better right. to get. The- Right. In there, but uh, but but if it's if it's in that neighborhood, and if if the family income is less than that, tuition to SUNY is free. Tuition, not room and board. But I was telling people, you got to live somewhere, you know. Right, <laughs> so, right. <laughs> uh, but but there's no tuition, and then it's you know you can really come out um, in in pretty darn good shape, you know. Um, I would say that I am generally very very anti debt, um, but the kind of debt that you might end up in here is much more surmountable than, than, than somewhere else right. of, of a higher price tag. It's just, it's just a fact. Right. And so we're, we're very lucky uh, with that. And, and I, you know, if you don't mind that just the prop for Fredonia, I just want to say that I, I don't believe our quality is uh, sacrificed in the least because of that. Oh, yeah. Well, I've had some co- uh, conversations with people I won't name who teach in New York and they're like, man, how do we compete with Fredonia? Like, <laughs> how does that, you know, because uh, and, and there are a lot of that that part of the country, I think, is really interesting in a lot of ways. Um, first of all, and this is my like non New York state, you know, I'm like California guy from the Midwest. But like I've always I've always been under the impression that like ed- if we're thinking, let's just think about education for a second. I've always thought of New York State as being a very strong state for education and that value and, and in general, but music education i know in particular i know there are a lot of people who really have thriving careers then if you look on a map and you draw a circle around fredonia like how many i mean because you yourself are a great example you're principal in erie uh right and then playing in buffalo uh subbing in buffalo and rochester and i mean there's so much within within a few hours drive and if you expand it to a day's drive you got like you got like probably a quarter of the country's population within a day's drive easy yeah, and and uh, we have a, another really cool thing that's up here that a lot of people probably don't know is quite as close as the Chautauqua Institute. It's mm. just thirty miles from here, mm-hmm. um, and I'm I'm really lucky. Last last summer, I had had a good day over there, so I'll be in the section with that orchestra now in the summers. Uh, which that's is, awesome! Is, wow. Is but beyond that, I mean, Cleveland is two hours west. Mm-hmm. Pittsburgh is three hours. Uh, going east, we have Ithaca within 
half a day. Syracuse, Rochester, like you said, Rochester and Buffalo. Um, and, and Detroit is not far either. You know, so we definitely are in a cool spot, especially for doing an event like this, because occasionally we have people like this time we have one of our, uh, in the high school solo competition, one of the competitors, um, she came last year from Buffalo in the last year they moved to, uh, I think Bloomfield Hills uh, near Detroit. Um, and it came back this year all the way from Michigan because, because they had a good time last year. So, but it's, again, it's only maybe five hours, you know, from Detroit to here. So it's, uh, we're in a good spot and, um, yeah, it's, it's, I've got a lot to be thankful for, man. And I'm, I really enjoy working here and, and uh, we've got a good thing going. I hope you all are doing well during these unprecedented times. It's crazy for me. It's crazy, I'm sure, for you. And it's crazy for all these folks that have supported the podcast for all these years. And I just want to give a big thanks to all of them. I know that everybody is struggling in this time. But if you need an instrument or strings or any sort of accessories, it would be great if you checked out D'Addario Strings, Steve Swan String Bass, Upton Bass, The Bass Violin Shop, Colstein Music, and the A440 Violin Shop. If you're looking for an app to practice, Modacity is a wonderful app. All of these people have been with me through thick and now through thin. So I just really want to thank them for all the support they've given over the years. We've got links to all of them in the show notes. You know, it's always something I thought it was really cool about that part of the country and to a lesser extent, I think where I used to live in Chicago, it's, it's fascinating yeah. living now here in San Francisco because, you know, it's the most populous state, but it feels so isolated in so many ways because yeah, we have LA six hours South. I mean, we're five to 7 million people, depending on how we want to think of it. LA is large, but then, okay, you know, Portland is 700 miles North. That's the next town of any size. You go yeah. East. <laughs> <laughs> thousands of miles maybe you, you know you hit yeah. phoenix you know in a day and a half or something so it's sure. it's just um it's uh that's something that i was i was at the pittsburgh bass symposium last year and that was something i was just struck by like oh look at all these people from all these orchestras and they're all right. just a few hours away um yeah. and then that that the um the, a further advantage if you just like look ahead past school like that area of the country is a great place to to remain for a lot of reasons. Like if you wanted to play, there are a lot of opportunities. If you wanted to teach, uh, whether it's in a school setting, a secondary school setting or privately or whatever, there's a lot. That's a huge thing that uh, I was just having a conversation about San Francisco with people who, you know, teach here. Like it's, it's, this is an insane place to try to go to school. Cause what you're going to, you, you know, I think like median rent uh, is like almost oh. four grand for a one, one bedroom. So yeah. So if you're going to do, anything besides investment banking or working for Facebook. It's just a really uh, tough place. Yeah. And I'll just say two last things about the Fredonia, New York State thing. The first thing, just in the interest of full disclosure regarding that Excelsior scholarship I mentioned, it's really important to people, if you're listening, just go read about it. Search yep. Excelsior. That's our state model. It's E-X-C-E-L-S-I-O-R scholarship. It'll come up, I'm sure. There's some things when you said about, it just reminded me when you said about uh, a place to remain um, here in in, uh, in New York State. I, I think that's part of the deal to keep that scholarship is that you do need to stay in the state for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but as you said, the music ed deal in, in general here is excellent. Um, and, you know, we have uh, a, one of the most, probably one of the biggest and most well-known music ed programs here in the state. And uh, my, my colleagues in that area are incredible. And, um, we uh, essentially have a 100% placement rate out of that degree, meaning that when people, you know, just say someone goes on maternity leave or whatever, and, and, and they call and say, hey, we, we need someone to cover a couple months or, or whatever. And, and, and we say, well, everyone we have certified is, is teaching. And so we, we can't really help you <laughs> with that. And, and so we're excited about that, though, because, you know, working in the arts is hard. And, and the fact that we turn out a lot of people that have the chance to, to, to get a viable job is, is a, you know, is nice, you know, so. Yeah, that's that's a good problem to have. But that that was something that's that was uh, amazing to me because I ended up getting certified and going back and teaching high school for seven years, and it was so interesting moving from the performing world, where after twenty five auditions or whatever, you know, to to something where it's like, oh no, you're going to get a job. You know, <laughs> what are you talking about? If you get a job, is what kind of a job do you want? Where do you want to live? Do you want to teach Never. this level or that level or whatever? Um, but yeah, no, it's a good it's a good place, right. 
Well, and so in addition to that, uh, you've got this Eccles uh, trio version out now, and you've got a lot of stuff out. You've got Massonet, a meditation, I think, arrangement. Yeah, so I have, yeah I've got and I've, I have all these things I want to do, too. It's just yeah. a matter of time. This Eccles has been on my mind for years, you know. Um, and uh, but yeah, so I've got the I've got six movements of box set in lower keys. We talked about that before. Yeah, uh, six sort of selected movements from the first three suites, and then yes, we have, I have an addition of meditation from Thais. I have uh, an addition of Bodicini Elegy, and then the second movement of the Brook Violin Concerto, mm. and the third movement of the Sessions A Minor a Cello Concerto, um, and uh, with the exception of the two concerto movements. Everything else, including the echoes, has come from uh, just a perceived need to save some time teaching. At least that was the first thing that got me thinking about it, you know, because um, I would find that uh, with the with the international echoes, I think there's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, the biggest problem I had with it personally and when people uh, were trying to use it was you couldn't mark it because how it was all set so close together. Yeah. It was really challenging to, to make any adjustments. And we all know that any, and this is my, and, and this side note disclaimer here. I said this a lot. When we talked about Bach too. I do not claim to have the answer. I really don't, you know, I, I, in, in terms of how one should play this, I just hope to provide an answer, yeah. you know? Um, but to that end, you know, any, you know, I think I told you this before too. Colin Corner, who we all know, Colin, uh, he, you know, he said to me one time back when he was playing in Rochester, "Fingerings are like a toothbrush; you should never use someone else's." You know? <laughs> and uh, and so that always makes me laugh, and and I think it's an important reminder because any addition you use, inevitably something's going to change, you know. And the problem I I used to run into all the time was that I, I I couldn't I couldn't do it. Plus, I'd spend all this time making the adjustments I wanted to make. And I burned five, 10 minutes in a lesson doing that. And now I can hand the student the part and say, go home and do this. And, and then they come back and they're really generally well set up with the notes. And then we can start to work on the stuff that makes it go to the next level, you know. Um, I was I was so happy, I must say, not that I'm an enemy of tenor clef, but I was so happy to open this up and see oh, treble clef for <laughs> and bass clef. And, and I can't tell you how many times me and probably everybody who's listened to this, who's done any teaching at all. Yeah, I even remember back to my one of my first lessons. That was, of course, one of my first solo pieces, and it was I introduced to it probably earlier than I should have been, you know. But like the struggles with the tenor clef, and then just like you're talking about, like everything being all crammed together. So you're trying to like write second finger in there, and there's no room, and write the note names in because nobody knows what this clef is, and like low tenor clef, and so it. Yeah. Um, I I appreciate the the uh, problem solving that you've undertaken in this one <laughs> well I'm, I'm glad you i'm glad you feel that way and uh it's one of those things i in a way i went back and forth with only because if we just forget everything for a second i i personally don't see the need for tenor clef on the bass only because the bottom end of the tenor of the treble clef rather it's pretty darn close to the top of the bass clef. Mm -hmm. So I, to me, I, I, I think it simplifies it. However, through those pieces, we learn how to deal with death and transfiguration or Ein Held and or, or some of those, you know, big orchestral works that do use the tenor clef. So I worry about that a little bit, uh, but I don't it, know. I, I just, yeah. So. No, I pretty well. And if you look at modern editions, tenor clef is pretty rare. It's just like, I think about it in terms of like wind transposition. If you really think about wind transposition, then he's like, this system makes no sense, but here we are because all the composers uh, going back generations have written it. So yeah, I don't think we're going to be uh, seeing zero tenor clef anytime soon for bass or bassoon or cello or any other instruments. But uh, I, I, I think just in terms of teaching, like, like I, I think there's plenty to work on in the Eccles Sonata anyway. Uh, understanding tenor clef and especially low tenor clef reading, I think that's maybe we can find another way to work on that besides the Eccles. Right. And that's another thing that I I just personally feel and I think I've probably run across from some other uh, teachers and players too is like the Eccles is not easy. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of people say, well, that's a student piece. And, and I, I just... 
it could be a student piece, but it, it's also just to me, it's just not really point and shoot, you know, um, particularly the second and fourth movements. And I feel strongly that beyond that, it's beautiful. It's, yeah. it's so just, I just love to play it, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I, I just feel like it's important for people to be able to do that and, and sort of not fight it any more than they have to, like any hard piece, you know? So I just want to thank you so much for being a part of this community. If you're listening right now, you're a part of the community. Congratulations. And I want to thank the people that helped me put this together each and every week. Trevor Jones, Mitch Mooring, Krista Copper, Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy. They are such great people. Just thank you so much to all of you for putting this together and being on this journey with me. But thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. If you know someone who could use uh, cheering up, we're going to try to keep doing that here on the podcast. So feel free to forward this to a friend, share this via social media, forward it in an email, anything like that would be really appreciated. And just thank you from the bottom of my heart for listening to this show. Uh, so you came up uh, recently in conversation. It, I, no, no, in a, in a very positive Positive way. I was in um, I was in the UK. I was filming a Discover Double Bass course with Jeff Chalmers, and I know Jeff supported was supporting the Fredonia Bass Fest, right? Yeah, we appreciate that very much. Yeah, yep. and, and, and just and, while we're doing it, uh, I'll just say also thanks to to Cincinnati Bass Seller for helping out, as well as Mike Griffin from Luthier's Care. He made my bass too. Those guys also did some support, so we appreciate that. Awesome, so. awesome. It's good. Well, so Jeff and I were chatting, and and you came up, and Jeff was talking about. He said he was just saying what uh what he was listening to you playing, and just what a wonderful sound and approach to tone. And I turned to Jeff and I said, you know, Kieran started on violin. And, and Jeff said, oh, that makes so much sense. And, and like, I, I, um, this is a huge question, so feel free to answer it however you want, but how do you think, how do you think that, and I know we talked about this back in 2017 about your your early training, but how do you think starting on violin has affected your approach to tone on a string instrument or tone on the bass? Wow. Sorry about the giant (laughs) question, but it came up. So, (laughs) well, I think the the answer probably lies within a different answer, Mm -hmm. which is that I've been lucky enough to have teachers that really push for an understanding of bass sound within the context of string playing. And I think that because of 16 years playing the violin since age four, I think I developed the idea of what string playing is before I even knew what it was, Mm -hmm. if that makes any sense, just coming up in the Suzuki school, you know, and, and just playing and just playing like learning a language, you know? And, and, and so I think it's, it's sort of ingrained just like the English language is for me Mm -hmm. uh, and for many of us, of course. And, uh, and, and so I think that everything translated, I guess it's almost like learning a dialect or something, you know what I mean? Like switching instruments for me was, Um, I think it just allowed, I think everything came over that should come over. And then what I had to really figure out was how to present the sound in the orchestra, which in many cases is different. I would say particularly in terms of any kind of like what we call maybe groove playing in the orchestra or stroke, you know, bow strokes, bow strokes. I mean, there's some similar concepts, I think, but I, I like I, I play violin once in a while now, and I cannot do anything with the bow. <laughs> I mean, I can move it side to side, yeah. and uh, and that's where I run out. If I try to go off the string or something, it ends up in the ceiling, you know. And it, it's like, and maybe that's just me. I don't know, but but I I uh, yeah, I would say that it was it was that, and then also I think spending so many years playing melodies on an instrument where melodic playing is natural, yeah. which on ours, I believe isn't always. Um, and I should qualify that. So no one yells at me, but uh, <laughs> I'm just, I was just thinking, uh, you know, playing melodies on the violin in the low register uh, is pretty, pretty nice, yeah. you know? And for us to play melodies on the, in the low register, I think is actually harder than playing melodies in the high register um, to really get them to connect. And, you know, if you're on the E string, is it really 
happening you know like is are you connecting note to note i feel like we must have talked about this before too it's sort of the impetus of some of the box stuff that i've done too mm -hmm. um but uh yeah i i really um feel uh i feel like just spending all those years playing melodies and you know i played very seriously for a long time so i spent four years in youth orchestra playing violin and so i you know i think just i, I knew i know more of some of these symphonies than just the bass part um from an experience standpoint. And, and that to me, uh, I'm just lucky with that because, you know, if I go take an audition and I, you know, I, I think I encourage my students to do this too, obviously listen and play along. So, you know, the other parts, but I think having literally done it on the violin probably changes, puts me, a, it, it's just an advantage. And I'm thankful that I spent that time doing that, you know, yeah, I think it's I think it's really interesting how uh, how just what a different role you inhabit, you know, in the violin section than in the bass section, like in an orchestral context. And then you also just thinking about tone, uh, something else popped in my mind as you were talking. You also had had two teachers that I think have maybe uh, 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 approaches to tone, perhaps I'd say that are a little bit outside of what I'd think of like a, a traditional orchestral uh playing in Diana Gannett and James Vandermark. I mean, I, I remember listening to Diana a couple of years ago here play a recital in San Francisco. And it's just like, I, I, I I'm, I, what I'm hearing is so special and, uh, and just like her approach to sound. So I'm sure that those two had a, you know, take your violin pedigree and then you work with these people with a, what I think a quite unique approach to tone that had to shape yeah. you in an interesting way. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think what I learned from those folks, as well as, um, you know, studying with uh, Steve Molina from Detroit Symphony and Alex a little bit, Alex Hanna when he was, because he was in Detroit when I was an undergrad, um, and Colin Corner, uh, and, and then like doing coaching's sort of post masters with Jeff Turner. I think I started to be able, and I should just also mentioned on the jazz side, Bob Hurst. I mean, he was a huge sound guy, you know, and, and, and I think what I, what I learned from all that is that you have to flex your sound for the gig, mm -hmm. basically, you know, mm -hmm. and, and move your sound in whatever direction the music needs. Mm -hmm. And obviously within solo, within orchestra, within jazz, there's a lot of colors. And then there's like the three big categories. Mm -hmm. And I think what's been really interesting for me that I've sort of settled on is that I, uh, at least on the for the solo and orchestra side, I use the same bass, the same strings, and the same bow with a similar amount of rosin for everything I do, um, which sort of goes against everything I just said, probably. Um, but for me, I think I'd still try to do that with this equipment consistency to just keep the variables down. Um, cause we got enough variables already. I've been sort of reimagining my setup for the first time in eight years and it's like, wow, it can start to become a real rabbit hole, yeah. you know? Uh, <clears throat> so, so there's that. And then I do, I do use a different bass for jazz cause I, I just need something a little, uh, you know, brighter, quicker, you know, you know, all this, but, 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 you know, I just, I just, uh, I think that's why I learned from spending time with, with this big group of wonderful people, uh, and diverse people was that you really have to to swing your sound towards what you're doing, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, so yeah. Love it. So, you know, uh, teaching tone to, to everybody in interesting ways and arranging uh, a ton of pieces and organizing bass festivals. I just, uh, I love it. Keep it up, man. It's, it's great. And uh, I'll make sure to link up. So folks check out the new, the Eccles, the, the Eccles trio. And you got a great video, um, which I was just watching through from a couple of years ago of the Eccles and yeah, I just, and practical Bach for, for the double bass uh, in red, registers that we actually spend time in uh and i just I, I i think it's really exciting what you're up to so i appreciate appreciate what you do for the bass community well and <clears throat> feelings mutual man and and, uh, and just before we sign off I, want, I do want to give a special shout out to james perkowski who's the guitarist on the recording 
um, and he did the realization of that upper continuum mm. part. And uh, so it's it's his writing that's that's in the uh, trio version that I'm selling. Cool. And and so I'm very appreciative uh, to Jim, and he's he's been here for for a long time. In fact, he's one of my official mentors uh, in our school of music. And I'm I, I just want to make sure I say that because uh, he's just a a wonderful person to know, an amazing musician and teacher, and uh, and just wrote a beautiful uh, uh, sort of realization of that upper part. So that's the only other thing I just ah. wanted to just That's awesome. Well, let's do it again soon. I've got my notes saying, Kieran Handlin, round three. Let's have a round four and five. I think I think Danny Zeman holds the record now. I think he's been on the podcast seven times. Wow. <laughs> but you're, you're catching up. So... <laughs> Hey, yeah, Danny and I have been friends for a long time. We were we were both Rochester guys for, for a while. That's so. awesome. That's awesome. Great part of the country, great place to be. And Fredonia sounds like a sounds like a great place. And I can't wait to hear about uh, Base Fest number six yeah. coming up and what the plans are. Thanks, Garen. Always a pleasure to chat. And links to everything are in the show notes. Definitely check out that Eccles arrangement and Practical Bach if you didn't check that out. That was, I think, our last conversation that we had on the podcast with Kieran. But yeah, good stuff. Keep it up. And thank you for listening. I hope that you are safe, that you are managing this pandemic, this economic situation. Again, I am coming to you from the past. It's just the way I do these things because the podcast wouldn't happen if I don't somewhat batch it. So it is March 26th, 2020 right now. Hopefully things are looking better in early April when this is coming out, but uh, we'll, we'll see. And no matter what, we'll get through this together. I I really appreciate you listening to the podcast. I really appreciate the team that puts these together along with me, Trevor Jones, Mitch Mooring, Krista Copper, Michael Cooper, and Steve Hinchy. And Mitch makes beautiful basses, award-winning basses. My friend, we got to know each other from Chicago, Sarah Nielsen is the proud owner of one of Mitch's newest basses. She's been putting up videos on Instagram through the pandemic, and it sounds fantastic. So go, Mitch, and definitely check out his basses. Thank you again for listening. We'll all get through this together. I'm Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more Life on the Low End of the Spectrum.